Just before we start, a quick shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Hypersonic weapons have been under development for decades and have taken on an almost mythical quality because of their main selling points of speed and maneuverability, which make them seem unstoppable. Recently, Russian President Vladimir Putin has been the man putting the hype into hypersonic, claiming that Russia has perfected the Avangar missile but can strike targets anywhere in the world at up to 27 times the speed of sound. This and their high maneuverability enable them to avoid current US missile defense systems, and that Russia now leads the world in this new class of weapon. China also claims to have the DFZF hypersonic missile, which can reach up to Mach 10. But are these weapons as invincible as they are made out to be? The US has admitted that these new weapons pose a grave threat and they are rushing to develop ways to counter them. So in this video, we'll look at if and how these new missiles might be stopped. The term hypersonic seems to have captured the public's imagination, but maybe for all the wrong reasons. Hypersonic, as defined by NASA in 2007, is a speed at which the air resistance becomes the major problem around Mach 5 and above. However, there is no defining point, like going faster than the speed of sound when going supersonic. Just like when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, the threat then was from ICBMs, or intercontinental ballistic missiles. However, today's hypersonic missiles have been framed as the biggest threat even though they are still far from a fully fledged technology like ICBMs. Hypersonic missiles aren't doing anything different from ICBMs or existing supersonic missiles. Their job is to deliver a warhead, be it nuclear, conventional, or using the kinetic energy from traveling at Mach 5 or above and hitting whatever the target is. Their extreme speed and ability to maneuver unpredictably make them ideal weapons against even the most modern aircraft carriers like the $13.3 billion USS Gerald R. Ford and others who are now more vulnerable than they've ever been since World War II. When it comes to ICBMs, what makes hypersonic missiles so much more effective is the way ICBMs operate. ICBMs follow a predictable ballistic path similar to a shell fired from a gun. However, unlike an artillery shell, ICBMs travel much farther because the warhead is mounted on top of a missile body with enough energy and fuel to travel up into space in a giant arc flying up to an altitude of some 2,000 kilometers where there is no atmosphere to slow them down before falling back to Earth. Here, the warhead separates from a missile body, allowing it to travel great distances at very high speed, typically around Mach 22 to 27 or 27 to 33,000 kilometers per hour before re-entering the atmosphere. Once it starts falling towards its target, it follows a ballistic path like a standard shell, although it can alter its course by several hundred kilometers on the way down by using thrusters. It's this predictable path that is the main weakness of ICBMs. If you can work out its launch point, heading and speed from space or other land-based observation systems, you can calculate where it will be at any point along its trajectory. And if you have a fast enough interceptor, you can hit and destroy it. Over the decades, various methods have been developed to try and make the trajectory and final destination more challenging to work out and thus hinder any attempt to stop them, such as using multiple warheads and decoys. Using these methods, it's currently almost impossible to intercept every warhead in a multiple missile attack. But suppose you have enough anti-missile systems placed around key strategic targets like command and control, military, political or large population centers. In that case, you can protect the most critical places, but you will sacrifice the less important ones. This is where hypersonic missiles attempt to fill that weakness with the two main types, hypersonic glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles. Hypersonic glide vehicles are a warhead launched by an ICBM into space. Instead of flying up to 2,000 kilometers like on an ICBM, they only fly up to around about 100 kilometers, where they then detach and fly at speeds of up to Mach 25 on a boost glide missile trajectory in the upper atmosphere, which allows them to maneuver more like a plane than fall like a ballistic warhead. 
To do this, they have what is called a lifting body. Instead of wings that provide aerodynamic lift like an aircraft, the body shape is such that it creates lift by itself, enough to glide for thousands of kilometers. Missile defense systems use tracking and algorithmic models to predict where the warhead will be to launch fast missiles to intercept it. By using control surfaces or chemical thrusters, a hypersonic missile can steer itself to fly around highly defended areas and confuse tracking systems, and do this at very high speed. This makes it much more challenging to shoot it down because its path can no longer be predicted and it needs to be tracked along its entire flight path. Now, this all looks good in theory, but doing it in reality is another matter. Traveling through the air is easy if you go slowly, but as the speed increases, so does the wind resistance. This drag on a flying object increases in proportion to the square of its velocity, making things particularly difficult at hypersonic speeds. A glider traveling at Mach 5 has 25 times the drag of one traveling at Mach 1 and a glider traveling at Mach 25 has 400 times the drag, and that drag needs a lot of energy to keep it going. A glider traveling at Mach 5 will lose energy 125 times faster than one at Mach 1. A Mach 20 glider will lose energy 8,000 times faster than one at Mach 1. And most of this energy will be used to push air molecules ahead of and to the sides, and most of that will end up as heat and shock waves. At Mach 10 and above, the temperature of the leading edges can reach over 2000 degrees Celsius. So the materials used have to be able to withstand that for sustained periods, which also causes air molecules to start to break down and create ions or plasma, which also eats away at the materials. This plasma creates a shield around the missile, which disrupts communications to and from it and creates a bright infrared heat signature, which can be picked up so these things are hardly stealthy. Then there is the lift to drag ratio of a lifting body, which is much less than that of one with wings. This is typically about three to one compared to a subsonic aircraft of about 20 to one. So you have to keep the speed up to create lift to keep it flying. However, with every turn they make, they lose energy and slow down and the range reduces. So doing lots of evasive maneuvers literally sucks the life out of the hypersonic gliders and limits their range. Hypersonic cruise missiles, on the other hand, carry their own engines with them. But unlike a typical jet engine that can go up to Mach 3.6, scramjet engines can go up to a theoretical Mach 25, though studies show that it's probably nearer Mach 17 in practice. They use the forward speed of a craft to compress the air in the engine which is then mixed with fuel and ignited instead of using turbines like a jet engine to do the compression. This means there are no moving parts, but it's a very tricky system to get right and has been likened to lighting a match in a 3000 km per hour wind. And they only work from around Mach 5 and above. The Russian Zircon and Chinese DFZF hypersonic anti-ship cruise missiles use solid fuel rockets to boost their speed to supersonic where a scramjet engine takes over to reach the stated speed of Mach 9 with a range of 1000 km for the Zircon and Mach 10 and 1500 km for the DFZF. At these Mach speeds, they can punch through existing missile defenses, making significant high value targets like aircraft carriers highly vulnerable. Russia has also worked with India to develop the BrahMos 2, which is thought to be an export version of the Zircon. These are relatively cheap at $2.75 million each and could be mass produced in enough numbers to overwhelm a country's defenses through speed and numbers. Like the hypersonic glide missiles, these hypersonic cruise missiles create a plasma shield around the front of a missile, which absorbs radar signals, making them almost invisible to ship's radar systems. However, this is a double-edged sword because the plasma also stops it from seeing forward itself using its own targeting radar or infrared seekers, and it has to rely upon an inertial guidance systems and up-to-date coordinates of the target being sent in real time. It also creates a bright infrared signal that can be tracked. To have any defense against these weapons, you have to know where they are well before they come barreling over the horizon, which means tracking them from birth to death, which is currently not possible in a proper joined up fashion. 
A hypersonic missile might be picked up at some point, but then lost again as it moves from one surveillance frame to another. To keep track of these, the information has to be passed from one frame to another in real time, which might not be possible if there are not enough tracking systems along its path. Hypersonic missiles will actively avoid areas with good defences, using their manoeuvrability to fly around them and through radar quiet areas to avoid being tracked. At this point, as it approaches the target flying low at hypersonic speeds and due to the curvature of the Earth, the surface radar won't be able to pick it up in time for current interceptors to respond. Currently, it would require the interceptor to adjust its trajectory three times faster than a hypersonic weapon to intercept it during its final phase when it's flying in a relatively straight line. In 2019, the Defense Department's Missile Defense Agency started a competition to develop a satellite-based system, the Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Center, or HBTSS. This will be a low Earth orbit constellation of around a thousand satellites that will work as one large network looking for the telltale infrared signature of an object traveling at Mach 5 or beyond, from birth to death, but also discriminating against those which are not enemy missiles. By using optical communications between the satellites, the target could be tracked over land, sea, air, and in space in real time, giving potential targets and defense systems along the way an advance notice of their approach to launch interceptors. It's not that hypersonic missiles can't be shot down, it's just that at the moment they travel too fast and unpredictably for the defense systems to know where they are in time to launch a defense against them. However, the USS Gerald R. Ford has one potential ace up its sleeve, the 300 megawatts of generating power from its twin nuclear reactors, more than enough power to run high power lasers, which have been tested on other smaller naval ships. Tests using a 60 kilowatt laser showed that it could disable small boats and drones, but to destroy a hypersonic missile would take something much more powerful. Hypersonic missiles already have to contend with temperatures of 2000 degrees C, so punching through this heat resistant material in what could be as little as 30 seconds from it appearing over the horizon, and to overcome the refractive nature of turbulent air over long distances, it's calculated that a one megawatt laser would be required. Lasers work at the speed of light, so as long as you can track the target, there is no need to lead it like a phalanx gun or an interceptor missile. Just point it straight at it and fire. It also has an unlimited amount of ammunition as long as it has the power and it's kept from overheating. In 2022, Northrop Grumman, who were awarded a contract to develop such a laser, said that they had completed a preliminary design that combined several laser beams into one and that a 300 kilowatt prototype would be scalable to one megawatt, but this would still be years away from deployment. As the saying goes, forewarned is forearmed, and having a tracking history of these missiles and their movement in real time would make it much easier to place an intercept or laser in the right place at the right time. So the short answer to the question of can the US stop Russian and Chinese hypersonic missiles would be no, they can't. But maybe in five years or so, they probably will. Now the good people at Squarespace are sponsoring this video, so if you run a business, blog, or are looking to set up an online presence, Squarespace can give you more fuel money with more resources and tools to help you get the job done. With Squarespace you can quickly have a beautiful looking website to grow your business or online presence. You can create and grow a community and use their powerful included blogging tools to categorize, schedule, and share posts and build interaction with their fully integrated commenting system. You can connect with your audience and generate revenue through a gated members only content. Manage your members, send email communications and connect with your social media accounts to push your website content to them and spread the word via your followers, all in one easy to use platform. If you have an online store, then they have new third party tools to manage inventory, promote products, track your sales and handle tax and shipping around the world. All you need to do to get started is to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. Then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash curious droid to save 
10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain.